Rwanda is a country like no other. The 1994 genocide radically affected its international image and left such a profound impression on the world's psyche that it was easy to forget the immense beauty of the country. Surrounded by Burundi, Uganda, Tanzania and the Democratic Republic of Congo, this small landlocked country in the middle of Africa has not only found a new peace, but has become a shining model of success for the rest of the continent. Renaissant and brimming with energy, Rwanda has an amazing palette of landscapes within its small surface area. With great volcanoes, its eastern savanna, and its deep forests full of rich biodiversity. The Nyaborongo River, one of the Nile's main tributaries, snakes its way down from its source at Nyungwe to the country's capital, Kigali. Since it was founded in 1907, the town has grown steadily with no great urban planning, gradually taking over the neighboring hillsides. 1,400 meters above sea level and home to a million inhabitants, the capital has built a solid reputation in Africa for its dynamism and cleanliness. Its bus station is a hive of activity, with buses and communal taxis serving the entire country. It's impossible to ignore the turmoil which shook Rwanda for several years. In 1990, an ethnic civil war plunged the country into chaos. It came to an end in 1994, after a hundred days of a genocide that was dreadful from every point of view and of which ethnic Tutsis would be the main victims. Today, an important task of collective memory has been achieved and has helped to heal the scars of a grief which still runs deep. There are memorials all over the country. The one at Kigali sits on the very site of mass graves where 250,000 people were buried. Whether it was the International Tribunal at Arusha or the traditional village tribunals, they all contributed to the search for the truth, however harsh it may have been. In the memorial garden, great marble panels still await the list of names of those victims still unidentified. The country has slowly been rebuilt, showing evidence of a spectacular vitality, an element of which is the importance placed on education as a tool to promote economic growth. A legacy of the colonial period where the Germans were replaced by the Belgians, French is no longer Rwanda's official language, even if the country remains part of the French-speaking world. While French is still popular among the older generation, English has become the country's official second language after Kinyarwanda. Sunday is obviously a holy day in this very devout country, and from a nearby church, the sounds of a choir rehearsing enthusiastically can be heard adding to an atmosphere of joviality. Around 65% of the population is Christian, the majority of which is Catholic. 25% belongs to tribal religions related to Catholicism, and another 25% is Muslim. Kigali's favorite method of transport is the motorcycle taxi. Several thousand of them roam the streets of the city or await customers. They number over 78,000 throughout the country and are recognized by their drivers' brightly colored tunics. It's a ubiquitous and lucrative business. On Sundays, the city's stadium hosts large crowds of Protestant worshippers, like those of the Rwandan Presbyterian Church. Singers, groups and dancers take turns on the stage. Fasha, I'm the 
The show is interspersed with sermons addressed to a well-organized audience. The clergy have pride of place. Everyone is well-dressed and the congregation is well-managed. Sundays in Kigali are also wedding days, and the women crowd the hair salons nestling beneath the narrow streets. Here at Nigo's, hair extensions are carefully placed, then braided, a style inspired by Rwanda's Congolese neighbor. The operation can take several hours. Wedding parties invariably end up in the town center at Gisozi Gardens for lengthy photo shoots. These women are wearing the traditional Rwandan hairstyle enhanced with a hairband. On the road to the south of the country, it becomes clear why Rwanda has been nicknamed the land of a thousand hills. Agriculture is responsible for employing 90% of the population. While rice is not one of the country's main crops, it has become increasingly important, especially in the low valleys. The country believes it will be self-sufficient in the cereal in around 10 years. Nyanza, the country's former capital, is home to a reconstruction of what was the royal palace. It's not easy to maintain a historical heritage when the buildings of the time were made of wood and other natural materials. This is a replica of the royal enclosure built in 1899 by King Musinga Yuhi V. This put an end to the nomadic traditions of his predecessors, who had no fewer than 50 residences throughout the kingdom. Behind the enclosure, this hut, formerly tended by a young virgin girl, was devoted to milk, the staple of the people's diet. Directly behind it, this last hut was reserved for beer. Nianza's most spectacular feature are these sacred cows, the Inyambo, who even today are raised as such and are still greatly revered. Every morning, one of the farmers sings a song in honor of the grace and beauty of his charge. Don't go, Milgo, yeah, 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 ye
Tima mende vugaro hanga ngo kurgo amende shodza mihe guaro da henyo kuse muro jorgo ma kombe karo chingo bihenda mareri kazira kui honzo mihe. A few meters away sits the last royal palace built by Belgian colonists in 1931. Little remains. Everything was pillaged during the civil war. A few kilometers away lies Butare, renamed Huye. It's the biggest city in the south and the country's cultural capital, home to several universities. Here, the Uru Gangazi Ensemble perpetuates the long tradition of Ingoma drumming. Rwanda's history was principally an oral tradition, and song was one of the main methods of communication along with poetry. In this dance, the women celebrate the return of their soldier menfolk. Our repertoire is very structured. We have songs which are also dances, and some dances which are just to music. There are some dances exclusive to women, and others which are the preserve of men. And then, of course, we have dances where men and women perform together. The Umu Hamurizo is a war dance which demonstrates the soldiers' bravery in the service of the king and tells of great martial feats. Rwanda is a small country with a surface area of just 26,000 square kilometers, smaller than Belgium, but blessed with a vast geographical diversity. In the southwest, Nyungwe National Park is one of the few places where the primeval forest has survived the ravages of woodcutting for the purposes of cooking and heating. It's one of Africa's most biodiverse forests. It's home to several species of monkey, including chimpanzees. Hard to approach, they have good reason to be wary of humans who have hunted them for a long time. This forest is known as the Forest of Demons, a name which has probably helped to protect this habitat from the woodcutters. The park's rangers keep a close eye on things. Nowadays, it's not like before, because before the people used to hunt them, sometimes for meats. Uh, but nowadays, the people, they renew the importance of uh, chimpanzees because they bring the, the money in the country to develop the country. So that's why there's what we call revenue sharing, that the 5% taken to the people used to be a poachers, and so that they keep away the forest. 
So now the chimpanzees are somehow safe, not like before. It's difficult to estimate Rwanda's current chimpanzee population. They are mostly concentrated around Nyungwe, and there could be fewer than 300 individuals. The species is clearly under threat. The population is in decline owing to people hunting for bushmeat, which is more prevalent in Congo than Rwanda. Chimp babies are also captured to supply the pet trade. Disease, the loss of their habitat due to agricultural or mining exploitation, and the fragmentation of their environment have all led to small isolated populations which may not be genetically viable in the long term. Less threatened, lursts or mountain monkeys have worked out that by the road is a good place to exploit the generosity of passers-by for a banana or two. Judging by the size of some of them, it's clear that these monkeys are not going hungry. The forest is home to over a thousand species of plants, flowers and trees, some of which are endemic. To protect the densest parts of the forest while making them accessible, the authorities have suspended bridges over the canopy. Walking along these bridges is a magnificent and dizzying experience. Away from the forest, close to the first tea plantations, are a few colonies of black and white colobus monkeys. They also live in groups. The beginning of the day is devoted to breakfast, followed by a long snooze in the trees while the youngsters frolic. Their biggest predator is not man for once, but the chimpanzees, who occasionally want a meaty change from their vegetarian diet. Now, the colobus, actually, they are vulnerable. They are not really endangered because the number is increasing, but they are vulnerable. So it means that uh, it's, they are not like a endangered like a chimpanzees or gorillas, but they are vulnerable it means there are not many left, actually. Down below the forest, vast tea plantations cover the gently undulating hillsides. Tea is a relatively recent crop in Rwanda, but has known a rapid growth and is predicted to overtake coffee as the country's main export. These large plantations produce tea meant for mass consumption. The finer teas are grown in the volcanic soil in the north of the country. The mountain village of Gisakura looks out over Lake Kivu, one of the largest in Africa. It's 89 kilometers long and 48 kilometers wide, and it constitutes a natural border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. The lake's edges are particularly varied. 
alternating deep bays with quiet creeks where fishermen trail their nets. Despite the high altitude, sugarcane has always flourished in Rwanda. The turmoil in the global markets during the 1990s caused production to fall by 50%. Sugarcane remains a popular sweet treat and is always on offer at bus stops along the road. <laughs> Children happily nibble at the cane on their way to school. The inhabitants of Niamashte by the edge of the lake grow rice and trade with Congo. Pirogues and canoes of all sizes leave the Rwandan coast for islands in the middle of the lake, some of which are inhabited. They then make their way to the Democratic Republic of Congo, whose economy has been devastated by political instability. Close to Kibuye, halfway on the journey north, the bays are more welcoming, and the hotels are beginning to attract a tourist trade, which is just waiting to take off. On the other side of town, the canoes return after a night's fishing on the lake. Great nets are cast and hauled in using huge poles. They've already delivered the bulk of their catch to a boat which came to meet them early this morning. They then return home with the small fry, which they will enjoy as white bait. <laughs> Elias Maubazi knows every corner of these creeks around Kibuye. His song invites tourists to come aboard his little motorboat and go to explore the wonders of the area. A large number of islands along the banks are veritable havens of peace. Nua Munini Island is nicknamed Napoleon Island, as its shape recalls that of the French emperor's hat. It's the biggest of these islands. This is not the quietest island, however, as it's home to a colony of bats. Kibuye is a small town that is growing fast. Its fjords, bays and creeks are its selling point and main tourist attraction. Every Saturday morning, a market takes place where the fishing canoes usually berth. Wholesalers and other traders have come across the lake from the Democratic Republic of Congo to fill the holds of their big canoes.
In a scene of incredible pandemonium, people trade in poultry, livestock, fruits and vegetables. The women are in charge of the plantain trade, while the men are the hired muscle. The biggest noise comes from the pigs, as every prospective buyer wants to examine the creature's tongue to check that it's not carrying a virus. This is clearly not too popular with the pigs. The journey north towards Gisenyi takes us past the coffee plantations in the mountains. In August, there are just a few green berries, and the crops will be at their peak between October and January. Nearby, a manual sawmill deals in the eucalyptus wood which has recently been planted on a large scale across the country to compensate for massive deforestation. Even today, the vast majority of wood is turned into charcoal for cooking and heating. These large planks they are cutting are destined to be used in carpentry. <laughs> Schooling and education are at the leading edge of the country's dynamic development. It is this that has helped Rwanda to rebuild after all the agonies it endured. At playtime, like everywhere else in the world, Football is the name of the game, using a makeshift ball. Gisenyi is the big town at the north end of Lake Kivu, on the border with the Democratic Republic of Congo. It was one of the country's first bathing resorts. The town lies at the foot of the Nyiragongo volcano. At the end of the day, travelers meet at the Nyamnyumba hot springs, seven kilometers from the town center. They relax in little natural pools of hot, sometimes boiling water, which allegedly has health benefits. The landscape in the north of the country is dominated by the volcanoes in the haven of their natural reserves. Karisimbi and Visoki are the last refuge of gorillas. At the foot of the mountains are crops of potatoes and pyrethrum, a plant with mosquito repellent properties. From 2,500 meters above sea level, the first gorilla families can be seen hiding among the bamboo groves.
The idea of creating a sanctuary for the gorillas came about in 1925 from the Belgians who occupied the country at the time. But it was the incredible work of Diane Fossey that increased understanding of these great apes. Her battle against the poachers ended up costing her her life in 1985. Today, the struggle against poaching is still a priority. But protecting the gorillas also involves very strict controls over visitor access to their living environment. This can only be accessed after a hike of several hours in small groups, and the observation time cannot exceed one hour. Here's the leader of this family group, a male silverback. They can weigh up to 200 kilos and live for 45 years. When Agashia took control of the group, he had 14 gorillas with him. Now there are around 28, including many youngsters. He has several wives, but occasionally these wives divorce him and seek their fortune elsewhere with another clan. Their diet mainly consists of leaves, bamboo shoots and eucalyptus bark. They spend more than half their time eating. The Virunga mountain range is shared with the Democratic Republic of Congo which has not implemented the same measures to protect the gorillas. Even though their population is increasing, the porousness of the border, corruption and poaching are a major threat to their survival. In the 1960s, gorillas lived at a lower altitude, but deforestation and demographic growth have restricted their natural habitat. There are now thought to be 800 of these great apes living in the Virunga Mountains. There are still threats today, not particularly for the gorillas, the main problem is the traps which the farmers lay to catch small prey, like antelopes. They catch them for food. Poaching is still limited. Protection such as this requires significant financial investment in order to protect a species which shares 97% of its genetic makeup with humans. In the valleys around Muzanzi at the foot of the volcanoes, Banana plantations stretch as far as the eye can see. Both this fruit and plantains, which are vegetables, make up one part of the staple foods. All of the villages produce craft banana beer, which is usually consumed at weekends or for festivals and weddings. It is never bottled, as it has a very limited shelf life. There are not many cars in Rwanda. People mostly get around on foot. These women on their way to a wedding carry small woven baskets known as agaseki on their heads. They contain gifts or personal effects.
The bicycle is the most common method of transport, including for larger loads like these sacks of potatoes, one of Musanze's specialities. Bicycle taxis with a plank of wood laid across the luggage rack are also very popular. Two great lakes face each other at different altitudes in the shadow of Mount Muhavura, the Burera, and the Ruhondo. Lake Burera is 1,800 meters above sea level and even has a few islands which are inhabited. There are not many fishermen, as overfishing meant that fishing was banned in the 1990s. However, some still fish by lamplight with nets under cover of night. The fishermen of Gasore village live in small mud huts. Activity on the lake is limited and it's mainly the younger generation who spend entire nights on their canoes. They have just cleared everything away and are getting ready to sleep. Many homes across Rwanda have no running water, and it's usually the youngsters who are on water collecting duty. Water is abundant everywhere, especially in the mountain regions around the volcanoes. Wow. Here in the north of the country, a variety of house building techniques are used. The most common consists of making bricks from clay and red mud, which are then dried in the sun. Straw is used to strengthen the bricks. <laughs> <laughs> the walls are then assembled. The mortar used is made from wet mud. The lintels are made of bamboo or eucalyptus wood. Depending on the family's resources, the roof will be made from corrugated iron, banana fibre or thatch. Fired bricks, harder and more expensive, are also used. These huge artisanal kilns are a story in themselves. Three huge furnaces blaze at the bottom of the construction. The freshly made bricks are then sent to the top where they are stuck to the hot surface to cook for several days. The beautiful Siohoha Valley lies 1,700 meters above sea level. This is where one of the country's best teas is grown, 
most of it for export. A large proportion of the Sawate plantation's crop is grown without pesticides and with the help of Sri Lankan specialists. The ultimate aim is to become entirely organic. In recent years, tea has become a real blessing for the region and the plantation currently employs a workforce of 3,000 pickers. We mainly grow green tea at high altitude, as it is better quality than the black tea. The processing plant was built along the same lines as similar ones in India and Sri Lanka, in the old style by American Joe Wertheim in 1975. Its success is as dependent on having been able to finance the complex with international public funding as it is on producing high-quality teas. Green tea accounts for 7 to 8 percent of production, reflecting its growing popularity. Sawati is currently responsible for over 15% of the Rwandan market. In one of the neighboring villages, the women of the Girishema Association maintain the tradition of agaseki basket weaving. They are sold with tea from the plantation to supplement the family's income. Heading towards the east of the country, there is the essential stop at an open-air bicycle garage. The bikes are severely tested by the tracks, the potholes and the rocks. But here, not only can they work miracles, but they also know how to decorate them to make each one unique. Down in Ntunga, the remarkable daily market is in full swing. In spite of appearances, everything is well organized and monitored. This is isombe, a paste made from cassava leaves, which is very popular in everyday cooking. Just as at the Congolese market at Kabuye, the women are taking care of the business. while bananas, sorghum, sweet potatoes and beans constitute the bulk of the country's agricultural resources, the fertile volcanic soil allied to copious rainfall allows these regions to diversify production. This is Akagera National Park, in the east of the country, near the Tanzanian border. 
It was founded in 1934 and at the time was one of Africa's finest parks. Following the civil war and the genocide, an influx of Rwandan refugees returned to the country, forcing the authorities to truncate the park by 50% in order to give them land. In the wet areas and the small islands of Lake Ihema, the papyrus and aquatic plants shelter a teeming ecosystem. The most obvious example is the hippos. There are over 1,500 of them in the park. They can weigh up to three tons and can live for nearly 30 years. They mostly feed at night, consuming 130 kilos of grass each day and can cover up to seven kilometers in search of food. Even though they can stay submerged for six minutes, they do not swim, but walk along the riverbed. The small islands and banks are ideal places for many species of bird, some of which are passing by during their migration, while others nest here permanently. Over 525 species have been identified here, from raptors to elegant herons. However, spotting the Nile crocodiles requires a keen eye, whether it be the tiny babies swimming happily around just beneath the surface, or the adults who blend in with their surroundings, although they can be between four and five meters long. The African jaburu, a one and a half meter tall wading bird with a colorful beak, is hard to miss. The crocodiles show no interest as they mostly feed on fish. But contrary to appearances, the jabiru are permanently on their guard and ready to flee at the first sign of danger. Warthog's unflattering Rwandan nickname is Pumba, which refers to the animal's erratic movements when it's in danger. Above the humid zones, tree-covered hills lead gradually to the savannah, where there are more than 1,800 zebras. In 1975, there were just 300 lions left here they're now being patiently reintroduced. We brought seven lions here from South Africa, five females and two males. There are now 14 of them. Three of the females gave birth. They produced seven cubs. That makes 14 lions. The park has not been spared from man's destructive nature. In the 1960s, there were almost 90 rhinoceros here. Sadly, the last one died in 2007. As in the case of gorillas, one of the ways to counteract this scourge is to work with former poachers and involve them in projects that compensate for the loss of earnings from poaching.
This waterbuck antelope has an unusual way of seeing off predators. When it feels threatened, it secretes a foul smell which makes its flesh uneatable. It is also important not to underestimate the nonchalance of the buffalo. They can be very unpredictable and think nothing of charging at visitors. Giraffes arrived at the park in 1986, a gift from the Kenyan government. There were originally six Maasai giraffes, now there are 90. Each year, 5% of the park's revenue goes to cooperatives, to people who live around the park. This helps them with a variety of projects, like building hospitals and schools. Involving the local population and helping them to understand the economic importance of the park to the region has borne fruit. Respect for the environment and the fight against poaching has made the region highly attractive and helped to make it a tourist destination. This is where our journey through the land of a thousand hills comes to an end, a land that deserves so much more than the bloody image its turbulent history has left it with. This small country with its treasure trove of landscapes and its dynamic people is the perfect epitome of an eternal Africa and the awakening of a developing continent.